Welcome everyone. My name is Karen Zagans and I'm the director and flute faculty member for Z-Tunes Music. I'm excited to welcome the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra oboist Emily Braybach as our clinician today. Um, Ms. Braybach has been playing English horn and oboe with the ASO since 2012. She's performed with several orchestras throughout the United States including the Boston Symphony, Houston Symphony, Kansas City Symphony, the Minnesota Orchestra, the Sarasota Orchestra, and the Sarasota Opera. Um, Ms. Braybach is an artist affiliate instructor of oboe at Emory University, a faculty member of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra's Talent Development Program, and she maintains an active private studio out of her home. So for today's clinic, we're all going to stay on mute while Ms. Braybach works through the GMEA oboe audition excerpts. If you have any questions, you could go ahead and type them into our chat box and we will address them during the clinic. All right, over to you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm looking forward to going through this music with you, so let's just jump right in. I'm going to start with the first etude, the slow etude marked on Dante Espressivo. So a couple things about this one. Um, first of all, this is a really great opportunity for you to work on tone quality and tone color, right? So this is a really beautiful legato um, piece of piece of music, and um, it also starts on a C, right? Which is one of the the kind of um, uh, most nasal notes on the oboe, right? So everything we can to just really keep your embouchure good, nice firm corners, nice flat chin, thing about an ooh the sound quality isn't too spread on that first note and if you have time to to um, practice in um, adding in vibrato because the first even the first measure right those notes go by actually kind of fast right it, it's marked on Dante Espressivo but the quarter note equals 96 which is pretty pretty speedy it's it's not too on Dante so we have to do what we can You'll, like a non Dante, like a slower tempo, right? So one of the things we can do is really um, milk the legato, right? Have as beautiful of a legato as you can, as beautiful of a sound as you can, using really nice um, vibrato. Um, you'll note that we have a couple of um, instances of tenuto marks, right? So that we have a tenuto over the last note of measure two, leading into the downbeat of measure three, um, and all that tenuto me uh, note means is that it. You know, it, a tenuto is a, you know, held, right? It held as long as you can and still be on time to the next, um, to the next downbeat. So it just means don't cut it too short, right? So we don't want, that's not, that's not a tenuto, but we also don't want, right? We don't want to stretch time at all. But use vibrato there and really try and have a nice light tongue um, as you're going into the downbeat of that next that next bar. And that happens a couple of times. So we have the pickup to measure two, we have the pickup to measure nine. Um, all these places with these tenuto, oh pickup to measure eleven, all these places where we have this uh, tenuto pickup into the next into the next bar, just really beautiful, not too heavy of a tongue, all that, all that good stuff. Um, breathing. Where are you going to breathe in this, right? So the first time you have a rest is measure eight. So that's obviously a good place to breathe. But if you need to breathe before, I think your best option is in measure four between G. So right that, if you are going to breathe to the um, 
the crescendo, right? So make sure that the crescendo is happening all the way through that half note. And when you breathe, you come in on the next note, the next note is, is that much louder than where you ended the note before. So make sure that you don't kind of diminuendo at the end of the note as you're taking your face, right? So we want to move through that breath. If you have to breathe there, if you could make it to measure eight, that would be, um, and then obviously we have another breath in measure nine, 10, 11, 12, and measure 12, right? So that, that a, the same issue you're going to have there as you did measure four, you have a crescendo. Um, so that briskly in the middle of a phrase, right? So make sure you crescendo through that a, you vibrate through that a, then you ended the A to really keep that crescendo going. Um, and the rest of the breath should be fairly self-evident. Eighth rests, plenty of eighth rests between there and the end of the piece. Just make sure that when you get to measure 20, you take a nice big breath there to get through the end um, and uh, are able to sustain a forte through the end of the piece. Um, another recurring theme in this study, um, the grace notes, right? So <laughs> for example, we have in measure, what is that, Eight, three, four, measure five, right? Make sure that the G happens right on beat three. You don't want the grace notes to make you late to beat three or early to beat, you know, both are, are um, mistakes that can be made. When, when you see grace notes, some people kind of freak out a little bit and go really fast and then end up too early to beat three. Um, some people take too much time on the grace notes and end, end up late to beat three. Perfect place for you to use your metronome, right? Um, the first thing um, you should do is just try it without the, without the um, grace notes. Right, so just trying to play it through and hear that in your head. And then put on your metronome on, let's see, 96, 4, 5, 6. And just 1, 2, and 3. So stop on beat 3 when you add in the grace notes. Just to really make sure that you're finding beat 3, right? That you can, um, you can really arrive on beat 3 at the right place. Um, I see one question in the chat. Should the grace notes be articulated? That is a great one of much debate in the oboe world. <laughs> no, the grace notes are under a slur. Um, and so anything that's under a slur, I slur. Um, however, there is a school of thought that if you see a grace note, you should tongue the beginning of the grace note. Um, I think what that means basically is that either way, personally, I, I think it's, um, if, if a note's under a slur, I'm gonna slur it, right? Whether it's a grace note, whether it's a written note, whether whatever it is, I'm gonna slur it. But if you do have a private teacher that over with your private teacher, and, and if you and your private teacher decide that you should articulate the grace note, I strongly recommend that you articulate it very lightly, right? So that it still has this legato feel. We don't want, right? We don't wanna accent it by accent, right? It's in the middle of a phrase. We wanna make sure it's nice and beautiful and slurred. Or, or um, legato can mean more than just not tonguing, right? Legato is also a, state of mind, uh, <laughs> right? Legato means, you know, you're blowing through, you're thinking about a long line, you're thinking about a beautiful sound. Legato sound, even though I did articulate the grace notes there. But if you are my student, I would tell you, no, it's under a slur, see a slur. A point of contention in the oboe world. <laughs> um, so I don't think you can go wrong either way. Um, okay, um, let's see. We talked about the grace notes. We talked about the tenudos. We talked about vibrato. Vibrato is your friend, right? The oboe is, is uh, the great qualities of the oboe is its beautiful sound. And one of its downfalls is that it's really hard to make a beautiful sound, right? Um, it's, it's, so <laughs> you have to do everything you can to just really try nice and beautiful and rich. Vibrato is your friend. Really great way to make that happen. So if, if you're not using vibrato yet, if that's not in your skill set, that's also totally fine. You just have to be that much more careful about a consistent airstream, really blowing through all the notes. Right? I said legato is not just the absolutely connecting all of the notes together with your air. So this is technically, you know, legato. It's not tongued, but that doesn't mean that. It, Right, that, you don't want to sound like that either. You have to blow between the notes. 
right? And you can do that with, you can play with that kind of a sound, that kind of a legato, even if you're not using vibrato, but vibrato makes everything better, so. In my opinion, uh, through the beginning here. Oh, I would also encourage you to realize that this piece basically only goes between mezzo forte and forte at the beginning. So don't feel like you need to go from your quietest dynamic to your loudest dynamic. It doesn't go up to fortissimo. It doesn't start at pianissimo. It's right at mezzo forte, right? So start with a nice, easy, beautiful, full sound up one dynamic level. And don't feel like forte needs to be your maximum sound because this whole piece is very gentle, right? Andante espressivo is how it's marked. So that espressivo, it's not andante, you know, fury of different sound quality altogether. So uh, really think about um, just going from mezzo forte to forte thinking about the fact that you should have a, a fortissimo above that sound, right? So you're still in that realm of, of beauty and full going to your maximum dynamic level. Um, at the end here, we have um, pickups into the last line. We have our needs to sound markedly quieter than everything else that you've done, right? Really bring that dynamic down. And it says in the beginning of the third line, crescendo poco a poco. So poco a poco means little by little. So if you see in measure 17, it says crescendo poco a poco. A couple bars later, we have an actual inked in crescendo, and then we have a forte. So starting in measure 17, we're not thinking about getting to forte until we get 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, until to measure 23, right? So make sure that you're not crescendoing too early. I have a lot of students who, when they see a crescendo, they go, all of a sudden everything's loud. So you shouldn't reach forte um, in, your, in measure 18, right? So I would actually mark out maybe a mezzo piano in measure A in measure 20, and then a, a forte in, um, in measure 23. So really kind of grade your crescendo out. The, the big point of the crescendo is the arrival at that forte way down the line. So you have to really control your dynamic there. Um, and then again, stay night full all the way to the end. And then we have a fermata on that last note, which just means hold it longer than three beats. So I think I counted out five when I played it. Um, I don't think that there is a correct answer. There's not like you should play it for 6.2 beats. There's nothing like that. You just have to hold it longer than three beats. A fermata is sort of uh, subjective. Um, okay, so I'm gonna play through this one um, one more time, and in the last class when I did this, I came up with a bunch of other stuff that I forgot to talk about, so maybe that'll happen, or hopefully, maybe you guys will have some questions for me. Okay. I did remember the other thing I wanted to talk about. Triplets versus eighth notes in measure nine, right? Right, so this is a really good time to think about the duple versus the triple subdivision, right? So you should be able to go back and forth one and two and one and two and one and uh, two. If you're having trouble getting that triplet to sound tri triplety, sorry, I hope I play and then I have to talk. <coughs> um, um, try and just go back and forth. Just put on your metronome again. Metronome is your friend, right? So I'm gonna have my little metronome app here, right? So go one and two and three and one and two and three and one and a two and a three and one and a two and a three and a right. So just get so you can do a couple measures of, of measures of, of triplets and then start to put it together a little bit more. Maybe on two beats of of duples and then two beats of triplets. So one and two and one and a two and a one and two right so going the going back and forth so you can go one and two and a one two and a one so you can go back and forth between the two the, the two subdivisions now the the tendency is 
to turn that, that third beat, that triplet in measure nine, into two sixteenths and an eighth, right? So we don't want it to sound um, one and two and da 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 da, right? So we don't want two two sixteenths and an eighth. Da 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 da. It's a subtle difference, but it's it's easy to to turn it into a either two sixteenths and an eighth, or an eighth and two sixteenths, or da 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 da, like a six. Any sort of like you know four subdivisions. Easy to turn it into that. So really make sure that you're stretching out that triplet, ya da da di, all through the full um, the full um, beat uh, beat three and measure nine. Um, I think that's most of what I wanted to talk about in here. Does anybody have any other questions? Thought maybe you saw you saw me breathe out sometimes instead of breathing in, right? That's a classic oboe move. Sometimes we get kind of backed up with air, right? So don't be afraid. Oh, my dog is has opinions. Um, <laughs> um, don't be afraid to breathe out sometimes. I think I, I breathed out in probably in measure 18 in the eighth note just breathed out. I didn't breathe in and then I continued playing and then I breathed in two bars later. Um, that's always an option when you have these really quick breaths that you have to take um, or this, this short amount of time when you have to take a breath. Um, so don't be afraid to use one of these rests to breathe out and, and practice that playing and then breathing out and then playing and then breathing in the next time. That, that, that's a um, have to do on the oboe. Um, do we have any other questions about Andante Espressivo, which is quite quick for an Andante, but here we are. No? All right, well, I'm gonna go on to the next etude, but if you think of any other questions um, about the first etude, feel free to type them in the chat. That's totally fine. We can go back and do that. Um, okay, so the next one we have is Allegro Giocoso. So, right means fast um actually technically allegro means happy but it's fast right happy and then jocoso means joyful so <laughs> they really are doubling down on the on the brightness and the lightness of this one um so i'll encourage you to think about that as you're practicing this um etude so I'll, here we go i'll play through allegro jocoso <laughs> very cute right it's very perky um, there's a lot of a uh, lot of lightness in this and I think that that's that's the big thing that I want to um, uh, make sure you guys think about is that this is Allegro Giocoso it's joyful it's light uh, it doesn't have to be super heavy and the tendency will be to make this super heavy because there's like three or four accents in every single measure um, I have water in my B flat give me one second um, so I want you to think about those those um, accents again. This is a good place to use vibrato. I'm a fan of using vibrato to bring attention to a note, right? So that if you don't want to um, play a note with a super heavy tongue, if you'd feel like you don't want to bring a note out with a, like a, all of a sudden a big burst of air, you have another tool at your disposal, and that's vibrato. And sometimes you can mix them. You can make a little bit of a heavier tongue, a little bit more air, and also a little bit faster vibrato, and that can help to bring attention to a note when it's super heavy. So um, so looking at the, um, the, the first measure, the end of the first measure, beat four, we have an accent on the B flat, a slur up to the and a dot on the G, right? So when you have a dot under a slur, um, it, it, it means to, to light on the note, except if the dot is on the last note of a slur. Right, so if the tongue, if the if the dot is on the last note of a slur, that means you cut the note a little bit short. Right, so it's a you're 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 gonna be helped out by the um by the accent on the B flat. You can vibrate that accent, play a little bit in D, and it kind of allows you to lighten up 
um, the G up, the, the um, staccato under the under the slur at the top. Right, and again, we have look at measure two. We have an accent on every single beat. Right, so again, we want to make it think about these accents as up inflections, um, you know, and not think dun da 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 da. We don't want to be too heavy and down. Yum, ba 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 da da da. Right, we want this up upward motion, like you have a, um, you know, like you're batting a like a balloon up in the air. Yum, ba 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 da 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 da. Right, think about that sort of inflection um, instead of super heavy. An accent doesn't always have to be super heavy. Uh, and then you know, again, we have. Slightly lower dynamic in the second line. And again, you hear how I'm using vibrato at the end of that measure instead of a super heavy tongue. Um, I'm using a little bit more air too, but that, that's helping to bring that um, up in, uh, in your attention and also allowing us to move forward into the the next bar, right? Those, those dum ba da dum bum 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 four to one, right? As it's kind of a, a pick up into the next bar. Um, especially as we're doing the, uh, the end of measure six is a crescendo to, um, into the downbeat of measure seven. So you really want to think about that F um, at the end of measure six, that F accent as, a, as propelling you into the next measure, into the um, me into measure eight. Um, and then we have all sorts of F business. Right, so you have a lot of F options, right, on the oboe, right, right F, and we have left F, right? Um, well, if we're going to and from an E, we, we do not want to use forked F, right? So this is not ideal, right? We don't want to make doing this motion because we have this F that we can use or we have this F that we can use. Hopefully everybody's oboe has a left F key on it. So measure, um, six, measure seven, you have that E flat on the and of two, and then you your only real option is to go to a left F because we have an E right afterwards, right? So we don't want to go, let's see if I can do this. We don't want to do that, right? You can actually use left F for all three of those if you want. Let me move my screen down. <laughs> uh, is perfectly fine to do for all those. I don't love using left F because I have a very short pinky. Um, so I use a regular F in the middle there, but you do whatever makes life easiest for you, not a forked F. Um, and then we have, after the double bar, starts with a mezzo piano, right? So this needs to be quite a bit quieter than what came before it. And we, again, that accent on the and of three, think about that as something to lean into and then and release from blurred to um, is a lift, right? So that G has an, a dot underneath the slur. It's going to be a little bit of a lift. And again, you hear me using the vibrato. Um, it's not the only tool, but a very effective tool for uh, for accents. Just because lay things really heavy and super heavy on the tongue um, as kind of a rule. Obviously, you have to do that sometimes, but I don't. I don't think this piece particularly calls for it. And then we have a subito forte, right? A sudden change of dynamic. And then back to mezzo forte now again. So I wouldn't worry so much about the accent on the beginning of mezzo prize no matter what. So just play, you know, several dynamics levels louder than what you did before. And that's going to give you that accent, that surprise. And then again, a forked F, left F situation uh, in measure 10, measure 12, right? You can use forked or left. Yeah, left, left would work too. I, in this situation. Um, and then after the, um, the next double bar in measure 13, um, that should look fairly familiar back from the beginning. <laughs> Again, don't, don't, it's not super musical, right? We want to think about upward inflections, jocoso, not, um, not furioso. Right? 
use the accent as something to lean into so you can come back on the on the staccato R, and then lift before the downbeat of measure 16. Um, let's see if there's any other F situations. Yeah, so you can use left F in measure 17 and in measure 18. And then I would use regular F at the end of measure 18. We have the same situation in 19 that we did in 7. So whatever decisions you make about your Fs in measure 7, you're going to make the same decisions in measure 19. And then we have uh, the last two measures. So music go down just a little bit into that fermata. It's not written. So maybe don't take time, but place that last, um, that last, uh, um, B flat that has the fermata on it. Just a little bit, so it's not, you don't want to overdo it, right? And then stop, and then in tempo. Right, and in this measure, we also have these, these kind of upside down carrots, the marcato marks. This is when you do want to use a slightly heavier tongue. That, that would make sense to use a slightly heavier tongue there. Um, but still play, again, like with an upward inflection. Don't be thinking about things being too heavy or too um, angry. Um, do we have any questions about this before I play through it again? Any questions about Allegro Jocoso? All right, so I'm going to play through it one more time. If you think of any questions, by all means, put them in the chat. It goes that fast. Give me one second. Let me check my metronome. Done. I was close. It's just a little. It's a little more held back than what I what I did. Um, I didn't address breathing. That's an important thing to um, to think about. So in this piece, um, we have a lot of phrases that end with a quarter note tied to an eighth note. Right. You can cut that a little bit short and breathe in the eighth rest. But if the, like I said, if the eighth rest isn't quite long enough for you to breathe, you can cut a little bit into that eighth note. Um, so play like a, a quarter note tied to a 16th note instead of a quarter note tied to an eighth note. So you have a little bit more room to breathe. Um, so measure two, measure four. Um, those are good places to breathe. I would not breathe in measure six just because that, like I said, that F, you know, at the end of measure six is a crescendo into the downbeat of measure seven. Um, so I would try and get through all the way to uh, measure eight and then breathe um, at the end of eight, beginning of nine, those two eighth rests. Um, and then again, we have a uh, rest in measure 11 that we can breathe in. Um, I did not breathe in measure 12, but that's also a place that you can breathe at the end of measure 12. And then we have these quarter notes tied to eighth and 14 and 16. And you don't have to breathe in all of these places by any means. Right, that's another place where um, we're different than a lot of other wind players because we get backed up with air. We have too much air, which is not something that, say, a flute player has, <laughs> has a problem with ever. Um, so we don't want to breathe in at every single opportunity to breathe in because then we end up feeling like this and it feels like we're getting strangled. Um, so don't feel that you need to breathe in at all those places, but do know that those are all places you could breathe. You could also breathe out if you need to. Um, I think that covers all of the breathing situations. Um, do we have any other questions about this or about the English horn, which I have back there, or anything at all? Any questions, anybody at all? All right, I think you've covered it all <laughs> for us, Emily. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. So I just want to take a quick moment to say thank you to Ms. Braba for your valuable insight tonight. And good luck to everyone who's auditioning for Allstate this year. It's been quite the year. Um, look out for more communications from Z-Tunes on lessons and upcoming clinics for Allstate and more. And have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.